Hello, everyone. It's, it's good to have you here, all the, the attendees. Uh, we, we are running this, this panel for micro this year. Uh, you, you have all noticed that we have a pretty busy program all these days, but uh, we thought that this virtual, this online format is a, it is a good opportunity to bring experts together and share thoughts, that, uh, share their vision about the uh, present and the uh, future of microarchitecture research. So we, we gave the, the title, the, the view from the globe in this uh, global panel. And we have uh, good friends and res uh, researchers who are very well known from different places around the globe. To make sure that this runs uh, smoothly, we had to find a, a leader to, to drive this. So we, we wanted to have a moderator that would uh, uh, take the lead in this discussion, and Steve Keckler uh, kindly agreed to serve this uh, role. Thanks a lot, Steve, for that. So I will be briefly presenting Steve, and then he will take over to uh, present the, the panelists. Uh, Steve is a very well-known uh, researcher in, in our community. He's vice president uh, of architecture research at NVIDIA. Before that, he was for more than 10 years, uh, for years uh, professor at the University of Texas at, at, Austin, at Austin. He, he works with his uh, teams and NVIDIA in different uh, topics around uh, computer architecture and microarchitecture. He's a fellow of the IEEE and the ACM, has uh, been awarded several uh, prestigious awards, and uh, his uh, studies were at Stanford University and uh, MIT. I'm also thankful to, to our uh, panelists today, Sarita, Koji, Onur, Per, and uh, Sri, who, who uh, along with uh, Steve, I believe, will, will bring uh, interesting discussions and will share their, their thoughts. So, Steve, you can take over now. Excellent. Well, let me share my screen. Yes, please. And let's see. Okay, can I assume you guys are all seeing that, seeing the screen, yes? Yes, we do. Excellent. All right, um, well, let's see. So I was, I was asked uh, uh, recently to serve as the moderator of, uh, of this panel, uh, a view from the globe or at least parts of it. Um, you know, it, when, 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 I, when I saw the title of the, uh, uh, of the panel, you know, it, it's sort of open-ended and, and uh, I just was thinking about, well, what, what do I wanna learn about this? You know. I think that that if we think about the you know our our community, um, you know, there's a degree of oops, how oh, there it is. There's a degree of diversity that is that is that is coming in um, or proliferating, um, geographic diversity is among among others. And what I wanted to get out of this was was uh, you know sort of an under better understanding of the different issues that different regions uh, around the globe. Are experiencing and how that might affect uh, the type of research that they're doing, um, you know, the interaction between their research and you know their the local environment, local uh, research community, uh, industry, and so on. So you know, uh, while I'm certain we will have a good you know, vibrant discussion around uh, you know, technical issues, um, I was also interested in getting some you know uh, personal perspectives from the panelists on you know those those issues that uh, that influence the you know the research community and their research uh, the research they conduct so so with that uh, slight bit of overview um you know we do have a, a quite a an august panel um i'm not going to go in great detail on their uh, on their bios and accomplishments uh, those are posted on the uh, the website at the uh, uh the microarchitecture uh, conference uh, page um, so let me just introduce them briefly, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, you know, the actual action of the panel. Um, so uh, I would definitely like to welcome all of our panelists. Uh, we have Professor Srita Adde from the University of Illinois. Um, you know, she's well known for her research in uh, memory models, uh, as well as her uh, service to uh, the architecture community. Uh, we have uh, Professor Koji Inoue. Uh, who's a professor at the at Kyushu University in the Department of Advanced Information uh, Technology Department. Um, and, you know, he does research in power aware computing, uh, high performance computing, uh, uh, and uh, uh, sort of advanced technology associated with uh, high performance computing. We have uh, Professor Onur Mutlu, 
uh, who is a professor at uh, ETH, ETH Zurich and Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and he's well known for uh, his work um, in memory system architectures, uh, as well as uh, you know broader uh, range of architectures uh, you know, since uh, uh, you know over the last decade. We have uh, Professor Per Stenstrom, uh, who's pro professor of computer engineering at Chalmers University in Sweden. Uh, he's well known for his work in uh, high performance memory systems. And finally, we have uh, Srinivas Subramani. Uh, who's uh, a senior principal engineer at Intel and the leader of the processor architecture uh, research laboratory. Um, and uh, you know, his work has, has influenced uh, you know, client and, and uh, server CPUs uh, you know, over the last uh, you know, decade or two. So um, in terms of format, um, I've asked the panelists to each prepare about a five minute position statement. Um, and then I'm anticipating that uh, following those, we'll have uh, you know, discussion and Q&A among the panelists. I've specifically asked the panelists to be prepared to ask each other questions and engage in some lively debate. Uh, and if I need to, uh, to push that along, I will do so. Um, and then uh, we will have uh, some moderated Q&A from the audience. So please submit your questions uh, at any time uh, through the, I believe through the chat uh, uh, portion of Zoom. Um, so, you know, I'll just say that, uh, you know, before we kicked off, I did ask them uh, some of these questions. Actually, I didn't specifically ask them to address the first question, but uh, I would like, like to do that when they, when they begin speaking. Um, but what time is it where you are right now? Um, you know, the panelists do represent uh, different regions of, of the world and be useful to, to get a sense of, of that. Um, and then uh, I've asked them to, uh, you know, consider the external influence of the, of, uh, the region or country that affect microarchitecture research environment. Uh, how you think your research has been influenced by uh, national or regional uh, priorities? Uh, what you think the most important microarchitectural research areas for uh, for your for your region and and, uh, and why? And perhaps areas that you think are less important and why? And I'm sure they will also expand upon you know uh, topics beyond what I have what I've stated here. Um, we are going to go in the following order. Uh, I've asked uh, Professor Owner Mutlu to uh, to lead off. Uh, and then we'll follow with uh, Professor Inouye, uh, uh, Srinivas Subramani, uh, Professor Stenstrom, and, and Professor Adbe. So let's go ahead and move directly into the, uh, uh, the position statements. And panelists, if you uh, have slides to share, please feel free to do so. Uh, owner, please take it away. Okay, th thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I assume people can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, I guess I'll start with the answer to your first question. Uh, I'm currently in Istanbul and it's 11.38 uh, p.m. <laughs> it's a bit late, but it's, it's okay, I think. <laughs> uh, can I share my slides as well? I think that'll- Go right ahead. It, 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 should, it should take it over for me. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer all of the tough questions Steve asked, but uh, I will try. Uh, uh, let me, I, first, I think maybe, uh, uh, start with a broader question. Why do we do computing? And I think my answer would be to solve problems. And perhaps Richard Hamming's answer is to gain insight and maybe extend answers to enable a better life and future. And I think this is a global goal. I would argue that uh, we, should, we have a lot of problems to solve globally. And then, of course, we design computers to solve the problems. And today, we're orchestrating electrons in today's dominant technologies to solve these problems. And we're having a lot of difficulties orchestrating electrons today scaling different technologies, as well as scaling different applications. So I think uh, globally, we need to solve similar problems. Uh, and we all know the, about the transformation hierarchy to solve the problems, right, that orchestrate electrons. And I think going forward, we need to expand the definition of computer architecture, which is already happening in my opinion, such that we can achieve the highest energy efficiency performance and also other issues like dependability, security, and safety uh, by co-designing algorithms uh, all the way to devices and specialize as much as possible within design goals. So let me talk about the broader challenges that I think is affecting everyone in the world, as well as our computing devices. Reliability, security, safety, how to build much more trustworthy and dependable devices is critical. Sustainable, energy efficient devices is important. High performance is still extremely critical because we have a lot more problems to solve. And I think personalization and privacy in all aspects of life is going to be a lot more important. And I think these are uh, summarized in this that I'm not going to talk about. Maybe I'll get back to it. So I think we need to build fundamentally better architectures going forward. And these are some examples. Now, let me go into some of the questions that Steve asked with this backdrop, let's say. Uh, Steve mentioned external and geographic influence on the microarchitecture research environment. I, maybe with questions, this will become uh, perhaps more refined. But I think globally and ideally, we should really be working together 
freely to solve the huge problems we face. And we have faced a lot, I think, uh, both in terms of humanity as well as in computing, exploring many diverse and big ideas without borders or external barriers. Unfortunately, I think there are four issues maybe that are influencing us. Funding issues, world and local politics, academic merit systems, and review systems uh, affect this goal. And these affect collaboration, immigration, focus on large advances, funding, and also reviewing biases affect uh, how fast we can make progress. We can go into more detail, but I don't have much time. Let me give you the local perspective. At Switzerland and ETH, I think we're relatively free. Uh, we can do fundamental research. We have ample funding so far, but we're still affected by global and local politics. Collaboration is affected potentially globally uh, due to uh, clear divisions between the West and the East sometimes. Uh, and uh, also local politics where uh, potentially conservative politicians want to cut away funding, right? Okay, so uh, the, the other question was more uh, along the lines of how do you see the similarities or differences influencing the microarchitecture research community? I think uh, the, these negative influences are not good for collaboration and funding and progress in general. Maybe flawed academic merit systems are similarly programmatic and also issues in review systems are problematic. Basically all of them take useful cycles away from fast and large progress that we have to make quickly. Okay, I think I, meant, uh, I answered this question. What do you think are the most important microarchitect research areas that research in your region should invest in? Why? And I think this is global. I, don't, I, I didn't really uh, pick specific regions for this. I'm going to flash the slides that I showed earlier. And I think uh, maybe some of these are quite important. Like we need to somehow find ways of fundamentally guaranteeing robustness, trustworthiness, uh, and fundamentally more energy efficient systems. In my opinion, they need to be data centric. And fundamentally high perform systems also need to be data centric. And I think we need computing architectures with maximal efficiency going into the future. For this, I think we need specialization. And there are some really important problems that we face in medicine, health, climate, genomics. And I think we also need to make our uh, architectures much more intelligent such that they learn from what they're doing. Today's designs are very static, I would say. And uh, we need to communicate much more information between the levels of stack. Okay, and finally, I think this was another question. What areas you think are less important for researchers to investigate? I think diversity is good in general. I think we should really avoid biases against any topic. Uh, topics we may not deem important may become extremely important going into the future and maybe vice versa, right? But we don't know. So I think we really need to have a healthy balance, healthy diversity. We should not focus too much on one area and too little on some other area. And I think I will end perhaps with something that uh, is much more local uh, to our research community and research communities in general which is really the review system. There are certainly external influences that we may or we may not be able to control, but I believe we can control uh, the internal influences like uh, the review system processes. Uh, I think reviewers need to be fair, open-minded, be accepting of diverse research methods, be constructive, enable heterogeneity, not have double standards. Because if you, if you don't do this well, I think we're really delaying and blocking scientific progress for non-reasons. And I will uh, conclude here, but I will also mention that I think Amir and, Jal, uh, Amir and uh, Jishan did a great job uh, this micro to invigorate some of the re uh, reviewer accountability uh, uh, issues and actually take them into account and maybe push reviewers to be more accountable in how they do their reviews. And thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Owner. Uh, Koji, you are up. If you have slides to share, please go right ahead. Yep. We can I share my slide? You should be able to share by clicking on the share screen button. Okay, all right. Okay, so can you hear that's right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, hold on. Okay, I'm Koji from Kyushu University, Japan. Uh, actually, my uh, the still first question. The what time is it now? Now it's uh, five a.m. So good morning, everybody. So as you can see, the window, it's uh, very dark, but at the end of the, this panel, maybe you will see the sunlight. So please wait a little bit time. So anyway, uh, I am a panelist from the Asia and from Japan. And the, actually uh, I'm going to the Kyushu University. Kyushu is uh, the Fukuoka in Japan. So I think the some uh, audiences may know the, where is the Fukuoka, but may not some. So if you attended the Micro 51 uh, 2018, that's what uh, that's attendees, we should know where is the Fukuoka. Okay, anyway, I will start. Now I would like to share the situation in Japan. So uh, the first question from the Steve. So uh, what kind of influences on the microarchitectural research environment? So actually in Japan, uh, 
I think the uh, funding, uh, it is not so bad in terms of the computing. So actually, uh, I don't see exact the funding against uh, for directly to the microarchitecture, but a little bit more widely, the government is funding to the computing. So for example, that we developed, uh, Japan developed uh, really nice supercomputers, uh, K and also Fugak, uh, that is right now the number one supercomputers. And also for young researchers, uh, government is also trying to uh, uh, give some research money as um, pioneering research on computer frontier. And also as a hot topics, just like quantum computing or AI acceleration, et cetera. So I think this, uh, the, uh, this kind of situation is very similar to other countries, but I think the, uh, the, the amount of money is not enough. But the, one of the good news is that the government is going to invest in semiconductors. So I really expecting that uh, direction. And the other point of uh, difference compared with, for example, the United States is that the industry. So I think the, in Japan, a uh, long time ago, many companies developed own CPUs. Uh, for example, uh, especially for embedded system or mobile phones, and not, not the smartphones, it's a mobile phones. So uh, many, many companies developed really nice, uh, low cost, low power uh, CPUs. And also, uh, uh, we were very active for semiconductors, but recently uh, government shifted a little bit from the such kind of the semiconductor business to the application or service businesses. So uh, right now, I think this is my understanding, but the, I think the right now the few major companies developing CPUs in Japan. So uh, that is, uh, I think, the, uh, one of the uh, disadvantage for us. So. Uh, the second question from Steve is how do you see the similarity and the differences? I'm not sure about the similarities, but for differences, as I uh, explained at the previous slide, I think there are less deep academia industry interactions. So uh, you mean, uh, of course, the Japanese company is doing a really nice business and also developing really nice computer system, but not so uh, many about the microprocessor chips itself. Of course, the, for example, the first supercomputer Fugak, the Fuji to develop really nice microprocessor chips, but it is not the main business stream for them. So uh, due to uh, such kind of situation, uh, we, we do not have the many uh, strong joint research regarding microarchitecture. And also uh, the other uh, problem is I'm, I'm seeing about the internship and the sabbatical. This is a really nice opportunities for students and professors. So usually in Japan, unfortunately, the internship means just the two weeks or three weeks, really short. And also this looks like a kind of the experience, not for accelerating research for student for company. So I think that we need to do more deep collaboration with academic industry with really uh, deep internship system. And also in Japan, unfortunately again, uh, the sabbatical is not common. Actually, I have never uh, used such kind of system. So actually I want to uh, take that kind of the uh, system. So I would like to claim that point. And the third, uh, the most important microarchitectural research areas. Uh, I think the, in Japan, so we have really nice uh, device or material technologies so, and also if we consider about the post mobile era, the device diversity is one of the key points, I think. So what many types of uh, new emerging devices, uh, how to exploit these devices for really if extremely efficient computing is very important. So um, right now in Japan, we have some uh, really nice technology such as uh, single flux quantum or nanophotonics, uh, nanowire and so on. So uh, how to bridge such new devices and applications is an important role for computer architects, I think. And also another point is that uh, we need to think about the environment. So environment-friendly environment computing, just like the uh, minimizing the carbon footprint or uh, intermittent computing must be very important. And the last slide. 
So what's the less important area for researchers? That was a really tough question, but I'd like to say all are important. So uh, as I said, in the post movement era, we need to explore the many types of devices. And also the, from the viewpoint of the applications, we have really uh, diversity of the applications. So how to bridge this application and software and the new devices is very, very important technology. And the computer architects can do such kind of bridging these two sides. So uh, in that, from this sense, um, revisiting microarchitectures for imaging devices is very, very important. For example, uh, I'm doing some research by using a single flux quantum devices. So in that case, uh, the device itself has some problem, but that kind of problem can be solved by revisiting old uh, microarchitecture techniques, just like prediction, for example. So I think they all are important. That's all, thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, Koji. Okay, Sri, you are up. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't have slides. I just made some notes on a Word document. So uh, even better. Do you want me to share that? Or <laughs> nope. Okay. <laughs> okay. Extempore okay. almost extemporaneous speech is perfect. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so so basically, uh, you know, um, so I'm not going to share it. I'm just going to sort of speak from my notes. So uh, so basically, uh, you know, in terms of uh, geographical influences, right, and what's actually driving uh, at least some of the research that's uh, happening in the India ecosystem. You know, firstly, the time here is 2.22 a.m. So uh, I think I'm a little bit three hours uh, right before uh, Japan. Uh, so there's a good bit of uh, push from the Indian government towards risk five based uh, uh, architecture, you know, uh, both because it's an open architecture, you know, both from an academic research and uh, commercial hardware development opportunities uh, overall in the India silicon design ecosystem, right, are, are, are pretty good uh, in a way, you know, because, you know, proprietary x86 or ARM license based uh, systems aren't seen as in the best interests of the of, of the country right i mean this is sort of similar to some of the other countries that we are seeing as well so so we do see a good burst of uh, uh, research in the microarchitecture and in the system development space around the uh, risk five based uh, right overall hardware software development stacks right uh, so now uh, if i were to speak about the top uh, research opportunities given uh, you know, given that India is a large developing country, right? So, uh, so I probably had four points there. Uh, the first is uh, opportunities around population scale uh, AI algorithms, right? And uh, cost efficient AI deployments, right? So, so these could be like applications in uh, public health or personalized medicine. Uh, so there are significant opportunities there in terms of systems, right? Uh, across the stack. Uh, so those are, uh, you know, those are seeing a lot of interest as well as a potentially a lot of opportunity and uptake. Uh, and then these can straddle multiple, uh, you know, all the way from the edge through mobile devices to the cloud, right? So, uh, so that would be the first one I would call out. The second is uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, you know, running on, you know, endpoint IoT devices, right? Uh, and, and specifically, I want to mention very resource constrained uh, endpoint devices, right? Uh, especially those deployed uh, in very variable climates, right? Uh, from the hot deserts of Northwestern India to, you know, to the Himalayas to, uh, you know, to, to the, the plains of the South and so on, right? So, so there's a lot of outdoor climate variation, you know, um, and, and especially in sectors like agriculture, uh, the, you, the, the potential opportunity for, for algorithms and devices, uh, constraint devices, robust devices uh, is, is pretty strong, right? Uh, so that would be my second example. The third is uh, in general, you know, the global, uh, you know, warming and essentially the, the, the larger, you know, political and, uh, you know, global considerations around uh, warming and so on, right? So there are significant uh, sustainability goals that the Indian government has and, and there are sectors 
uh, like renewable energy, you know, where the government wants to see, you know, more rapid adoption, right, of renewable energy. Uh, so there are significant uh, opportunities around visual AI algorithms, you know, things like pollution monitoring uh, and so on, right? So, uh, so I would call that out as, as a third example. And fourthly, uh, you know, like India is an extremely, uh, you know, diverse country, right, with lots of languages, probably 100 languages and dialects. So there's a lot of opportunity around, uh, let's say, neural machine translation. Um, there's a lot of digital content in both English and Hindi, which is one of the most, uh, uh, you know, widely used languages in India, but then making it available to smaller communities that speak, uh, you know, regional dialects, right? Uh, and on more, you know, on more constrained mobile devices, right? So this is important for both providing equal opportunities as well as uh, livelihoods and in general, uh, sort of bridging the rural uh, urban divide, right? So, so these are, you know, uh, sort of uh, imperatives at the national level, which sort of translate into uh, systems and microarchitecture opportunities, right? So, uh, and then uh, uh, from an industrial uh, research standpoint, uh, you know, at least my experience has been that, uh, you know, having a co-location, you know, uh, from a software and a hardware development standpoint certainly helps uh, microarchitecture research, you know, from towards bringing, uh, you know, innovation to market uh, uh, so that's something. Um, and in terms of important uh, microarchitecture research domains, I feel uh, going forward. So this would be my last four points before I conclude. Uh, the first is, uh, you know, challenges around power density, which have been increasing very significantly, uh, you know, with decreasing FMAX and, you know, uh, very shortened uh, frequency turbo durations, right? So we'd like to see more microarchitecture and design techniques to sort of mitigate some of these really severe problems going forward. Uh, secondly, how do you combine general purpose CPU processing and, and AI processing, right? Especially as AI algorithms evolve at a pretty fast rate, do you need, you know, sort of custom memory systems? Do you need, uh, uh, you know, what kinds of co-design would you need for that, right? So that would be my, my second one there. The third is large code footprints, uh, you know, uh, workloads that are essentially caused by, you know, as, as, a, as a side effect of, you know, emerging language infrastructures, right? Like HTML5, JavaScript, uh, and so on. And, and how do you re-architect uh, core CPUs for the future for these new applications ecosystems, right? Uh, and this is something that straddles both mobile client and servers. And finally, uh, uh, data center application architectures, it's sort of gone from monolithic to disaggregated. Uh, even the hardware architecture is getting really disaggregated, right? As you look at IPUs, DPUs, FPGAs, you know, accelerators and so on. So I think there are significant opportunities around, you know, enabling efficient, you know, accelerator to accelerator cooperative execution, right? And consolidation of memory, you know, reduction of TCO. And, and, and these are some of the things where there's significant impact to be had, uh, you know, at the commercial level as well. So I'll conclude here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sri. Okay, uh, Per, your turn. Thank you, Steve. Yes, let me see if I can bring my presentation up here. Uh, so the first question that Steve asked, what time is it over here? Uh, it's 11 o'clock in, in the night, but uh, that doesn't bother me because I used to work late, so that's okay. Uh, so uh, so let's zoom into what's happening in Europe because there are a lot of you know, quite interesting things that uh, are going on. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, um, uh, the European Union together with all the member states actually decided to uh, build a new uh, process for industry essentially. So in fact, um, based on uh, Central European funding, plus funding from member states, plus investments, uh, it's a, a quite a huge amount of money, 10 billion euros that goes into this initiative. Uh, that has happened before with uh, Airbus actually. So that was uh, created out of these kind of initiatives too. So the objective here is to develop a European high-end next generation processor with a world-class supercomputing ecosystem. So that's quite a, uh, an ambitious goal. 
and uh, it's backed by 30 plus countries uh, in Europe. Uh, and um, as I said, with a lot of funding. So there is also uh, a joint undertaking that has been created to join forces among all the member states. Um, so here is, uh, so in 2018 in December, uh, almost three years ago, uh, this uh, project uh, uh, launched, was launched and um, um, uh, there are 28 partners from 10 uh, European countries that are um, uh, in, in this uh, big project. And as you can see, there are ma many of the institutions that usually show up at micro that uh, or are active members of the computer architecture community that are also part of this one. Plus a number of companies. You can note that there are like uh, uh, car companies. Uh, car, the car industry is very important for Europe. And, and so um, of course, this has to do with self-driving cars and all that to really uh, fuel that developments, those developments. Uh, here is just a, a graph of the overall architecture. It's tile architecture. And there are actually two types of tiles, so to say, general purpose arm based uh, uh, tile. And then uh, the other one is a risk five based uh, and risk five based accelerator, um, uh, which um, is another team around. And in fact, what happened just uh, uh, two months ago. We, we got the test chip back for the uh, first test chip, and it actually could say hello world in all the European languages. That was a good start. Uh, what is amazing is that so, uh, my team is part of uh, this EPAC, uh, the Risk V based accelerator. And um, I was not very optimistic that we were going to. Uh, actually um, make the you know a successful first test chip knowing that there are like 10 different groups distributed across Europe that were going to build a chip right and do the integration and verification all that but uh, that's truly amazing anyway so uh, let's move on here so my view about the agenda and I think I speak for a lot of colleagues here in Europe is that what is important is of course that we have um uh, we have uh, taken off on the accelerator centric in the accelerator centric era, and that is here to stay. And the challenges here is that to some of the challenges here is to identify broad application domains. Uh, uh, and uh, what also um, owner mentioned is that cross layer interaction will be even more important. And I don't think that computer architects can do that alone. What we have to do is to team up with uh, colleagues in, in uh, all the way from algorithms down to, uh, to, te to uh, te technology. And uh, so we have to go all, all, all the way through, through the transformation hierarchy and build projects with um, collaboration across disciplines. I've made a note about general purpose, special purpose computing. I mean, it's really important to add flexibility to these accelerators so that they can be programmable. Again, so we need to also look, look across the transformation hierarchy. It's a very, uh, very exciting uh, era because you can do a lot of optimizations in all these layers down to the accelerator and make it more flexible, right? And of course, being a fan of memory system research, I, I cannot, uh, I have to have one line on that. The memory bottleneck is not going, going away, especially not since the, you know, applications are for the, uh, for the most part data centric. And I'm still very interested in this topic and uh, involved in a startup that is uh, actually, um, trying to fix part of this problem. I would say in closing, uh, going back to some of the questions that Steve asked, I mean, there's a lot of funding in Europe these days in uh, computer architecture, and it's very much research uh, driven, uh, which is very nice. I mean, you have free, uh, you have agencies, of course, as 
like uh, Natural Science Foundation in all the member states in the in the in Europe, but there is also the European Research Council that funds excellent uh, excellence in research and. Uh, um, so that's uh, really you know, free academic research. And then there are all these European initiatives. Uh, I just talked about one, but there are lots of projects in the computer architecture area. Uh, I've talked about uh, the most important areas, the less, less important. I think I, I joined the choir that, I mean, uh, I also call for diversity. It's sad to see that some topics are dropped and some topics become super, you know, hyped and things like that. So diversity is great. I, I think I stopped there in, in the interest of using the uh, time as efficiently as possible. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Per. Okay, Sarita. You can. Um, all right. So um, the way I structured my uh, slides was that I'm going to talk about the, a project that I'm very passionate about right now that I'm doing for a couple minutes, and then uh, pause and discuss how that relates to the questions that Steve raised. Okay. So I thought about how did my environment affect uh, what I'm doing, right? And so I will address it in that context. Okay. So this is preaching to the choir. Uh, we have an, uh, you know, we are in the era of specialization. Uh, there's an explosion of accelerators in SOCs, and our community has really embraced the idea of how to design specialized accelerators, tons of research in this area. But in my group, we've been uh, asking the question in the last uh, few years, uh, how do we design specialized systems, okay, where there are a ton of accelerators on the system? Right. So how do we uh, design the communication, the compiler, the runtime, the applications, and so on. And then at the same time, the other big um, um, uh, thing that's happening around us is the rise of the edge. Right. So there's uh, virtual and augmented reality, there's robotics, there's autonomous vehicles, there's all sorts of edge applications that are really not applications, but edge systems. Right. Um, and they all have challenging performance demands. They have stringent resource constraints, end-to-end um, -end quality metrics. And so the question is, how do we design these specialized systems? And um, this has been alluded to before, but uh, there's a whole plethora of technologies we can come up with that, that require research for scalable and generalizable system specialization. So you wanna be scalable in the sense that your end-to-end -end quality needs to scale with resource usage. Uh, the application features need to um, uh, scale with hardware and software design time. You want to be generalizable in the sense that you want to be, uh, you want to develop this suite of techniques that are application driven, uh, that are end to end quality driven, that have hardware software application co design, uh, generalizable techniques so that you can create a system in this way. Right. So all of this we understand and we know, but to do this type of research to build these systems of, of the next decade. I think one key question, a key thing that we have to ask is, you know, what application are we going to ground our research in? Obviously, we want we want this to be generalizable, but uh, a few years ago, we realized we cannot do this type of work without a real honest to God application uh, infrastructure. And so uh, it just so happened that at that time, my colleague Steve Laval had just returned from a very successful startup experience. He was the uh, uh, founding uh, chief scientist of Oculus. And so, uh, you know, virtual reality was in again, and this was very exciting. And, you know, it was going to be the next computing interface. So we started working on virtual augmented and mixed reality. And this is a great domain to be working in because there's an orders of magnitude gap between what we are able to do um, today's devices and what we want to do um, in the desirable devices. So in terms of power, performance, quality of experience and what have you. This is great from an architect's perspective, but what's also challenging from doing research perspective is that again, this is a system and it requires diverse expertise in graphics and vision and audio, video, optics, haptics and so on. Uh, requires cross layer system co-design to meet these requirements, complex metrics, but the biggest stumbling block for us was that the systems are closed. Uh, there were no open XR systems, few participants in the space. 
So no open reference systems or benchmarks. And this is true of many of the applications that I presented earlier. So these systems today represent a large barrier to entry for open R&D. And so that's what we decided to solve. We said that this is really the important problem. We need to be able to democratize XR systems, research development and benchmarking. And so we did a lot of work the last few years. We've been focused on developing Elixir, which is the Illinois Extended Reality Testbed. We've been able to develop the first open source full system XR testbed, which has state of the art components, extensively characterized and it's ready for research. Um, we have a, launched a consortium with industry and academic partners. So we get the whole community working together on this testbed um, to, to uh, standardize uh, benchmarking methodology, et cetera, so we can move this community forward. So this has not been business as usual research for me. This is very different from what I've done in the past, but it's certainly been probably the most exciting and I hope the most impactful research or work that I will do. Now, what made it happen, right? What did it take? Okay, so this was first thing, Team Elixir, a lot of people, but it all started with one student, who's Efa Muhammad, who is uh, the soul of, of this work. Without him, nothing would happen. So here's a real quick rundown of what made this happen, and then hopefully I can answer more questions. So I give a lot of credit to a funding ecosystem here in the US, uh, which is a government industry partnership between the Semiconductor Research Consortium and DARPA, which funds research centers that have about 20 or so faculty. And this is blue sky, you know, out there research that is funded, very flexible funding. So in about 2016, there was a call for a seed grant, just 50K. And, you know, it was just this one conversation, two conversations I had with my colleague, uh, Josefa, very excited student. We didn't know anything about XR, okay? But we were convinced about the importance of the problem and make and, and convinced that we would make progress. And so they funded us, we made progress slowly, slowly. Um, uh, this then became a major thrust for the next center. Uh, there was industry involvement from the beginning, lots of interaction, lots of encouragement, student internships, lots of conversations, uh, both on our campus, just because there's so many people here and with other researchers. And in 2020, Elixir 1.0 was released. 2021, we launched the consortium. And Micro 21, today, the first external paper using Elixir was, was presented where we were not involved other than to help that group. Interestingly, our paper has still not appeared, but that's a whole different story. And then uh, we also got funding from NSS now to convert this into a community research infrastructure. So, so you know, buying from NSF. So I think this ecosystem to first fund blue sky ideas where conversations, collaborations are encouraged. There's a broad view of impact. It's not just papers and where infrastructure is, we are not quite there yet, but I think NSF is starting. The infrastructure is not just treated as a service that you know second tier people will do, but as a first class enterprise for frontline researchers to do uh, is something that has enabled this work. So that's uh, my spiel. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, okay, so we're going to proceed to uh, the next portion of our program, which is uh, some discussion and QA. I would certainly like the, uh, the panelists to uh, be prepared to ask some questions of each other. I'll, I'll kick this off in just a moment. But at the same time, um, you know, we have over 150 participants in the audience. This is a good time for you guys to uh, you know, make yourself known by entering your questions, I believe, in the Q&A uh, box on Zoom. So please go ahead and do that, and we'll get to those in just a moment. So let, let me kind of kick this off a little bit and, and uh, highlight uh, one thing I, I heard from a few people, and that is um, sort of this, this, this notion of um, you know, the opportunity to have an open um, innovation environment. Um, you know, so Koji, you mentioned that uh, you know, uh, you know, CPUs in, in Japan are, are diminishing. Um, uh, pair, you mentioned sort of the investment in in uh, you know ARM and uh, you know new uh, CPU architectures. Uh, three, you also uh, mentioned that as a priority. Um, can you can can you guys elaborate on sort of your perspective on you know the opportunity that we have now that may be different than you know ten years ago? Whether it be you know the the opportunity for you know, new ICEs or uh, you know accelerators or, or or just sort of new new things in the space. Um, who, who would like to start? Don't okay, be so shy. I, I, I'll comment a little bit. 
Okay. Please. So, so in Japan, I think the uh, many, many microprocessors designed by the company, but usually they uh, decided to develop by own CPUs. That was not so open. So I think that's uh, closed uh, the, mar the space for the market. So, but right now, uh, still, uh, some companies are also trying to risk five instruction set architectures. So maybe the hardware is uh, becoming more open. So I think the uh, we need to think uh, companies need to think about how we can monetize not the uh, maybe the CPU itself, but also the service CPU plus uh, software plus application plus service. So uh, such kind of the movements is uh, going on in Japan, I think. I think it's uh, quite similar in Europe. There has been an increasing interest for open source hard hardware. And uh, so in, in many of the um, uh, projects around EPI, uh, there are actually, um, they are op open hardware projects. And there's been a lot of, uh, in, uh, at ETH, and uh, Ono knows a lot about that, Luca Benini has been driving this for many, many years. So I think there is a movement actually going on in, in Europe towards open, open hardware. There's obviously a challenge with that as well, right? I mean, you know, there's, you know, large companies who continue investing billions of dollars to innovate, uh, you know, in this space. Um, you know, wh where do you where do you think that will happen? Do you think that that the you know, open architectures will provide a, a platform for, for innovation that then will you know enable uh, you know or for research innovation that will then you know influence uh, you know the, the broader uh, you know architecture community and and, uh, and industry, or do you think that they will you know uh, result in uh, you know, competitive platforms, um, you know, that will broaden the, uh, you know, the space of, of competitiveness, if you will. I mean, wh wh where do you, where do you, wh where do you think that will go given kind of what you're thinking in, in, uh, about your own research and, and the, uh, regions you operate? So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Three. so one thing, I, yeah. So one thing I wanted to add was, uh, I think, uh, you know, given, uh, you know the chiplet based disaggregation right the given those trends i think the opportunities for 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 building ips and building systems using an overall uh, right open ecosystem as a way to differentiate uh, with low cost offerings uh, and to build for businesses to build their own custom systems uh, i think it sort of leveled the playing, playing field uh, quite a bit right so i see both these trends uh, together in some sense uh, Right, creating wider opportunities, right, for both research and prototyping. Other other perspectives. Yeah, so okay, I have one comment. So I think the, uh, for example, in the uh, Fugak supercomputer in Japan, so Fujitsu did really nice work because they changed the uh, instruction set architecture to ARM, but the, they did really nice design in from the viewpoint of micro architecture. So this is a high performance computing, uh, ARM uh, microprocessor for high performance computing. So uh, such kind of the, maybe the open, uh, open source uh, movements will give us some uh, common uh, opportunity, but under or upper decide how we can make a more uh, advantage on the open interface. So that is one of the key points. So from this point of view, I think the micro architecture design becomes more and more important in open uh, source uh, movement. Let me follow on that with a, with a question that just came in. Um, uh, it's a question for Koji. It says, Koji, you remind me of the stories in the 1990s. NEC has their own x86 processors in the past. Just curious where those technologies went after that golden age and what is different from now and the past in terms of processor development in Japan. Uh, okay, so uh, it's a tough question. Actually, I'm working at the uh, academia, so <laughs> I'm not sure I can take, uh, share the correct opinion, but the, 
uh, I think the basically the business model they changed from the uh, semiconductor business to the more service businesses. But the, unfortunately, they uh, separated the very strong design team or circuit designers to other companies or other divisions. But right now, uh, as uh, many panelists also uh, discussed, the interaction, well, cross-layer interaction is very important. So for example, the Google also uh, designed a TPU with their own services. And also Apple designed the old microprocessor with uh, their really nice uh, Apple service. So I think now the movement is move, uh, changing to the interaction with circuit design, the microarchitecture design, the system software design, application design, and the service design. So such kind of loop we have to take. But right now in Japanese companies, many Japanese companies are missing the semiconductor or microarchitecture part. So I think we need to accelerate that area again to make this kind of the complete loop of the system. Let me go to a question um, from Eric Altman, which is similar to the question I had, I had uh, written as well. Um, are any government uh, restrictions slowing research? For example, impediments to immigration, uh, technology sharing, startups, you know, sort of government policies or regional policies. Uh, you know, let me address that to the panel. I think we're probably all experiencing that, perhaps experiencing that in different ways. So maybe each, each panelist could address that one. Sarita, would you like to, 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 to start? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, definitely, you know, hopefully things will change in the US, but certainly the last few years um, had a pretty noticeable impact in terms of students, um, you know, coming in or not um, because of all of the immigration policies. I mean, that was pretty clear, right? Many of us have personal stories to say, where a student, uh, we, uh, you know, left, uh, left um, uh, the university after a master's instead of continuing with a PhD because you know, they were worried about visa issues, not being able to go back home, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's just, there's just um, tons of such stories. So, uh, but that, you know, hopefully that was temporary. So uh, definitely immigration is super important to our ecosystem. There's no question about that. Um, we um, obviously do a lot of work to encourage domestic students. We want to encourage that pool, increase that pool. But at the same time, we, we are a global society now. There's no denying that. And um, any kind of impediment to that exchange of people, ideas is, is a problem. Yeah, I think I wanted to reflect on the other side of it. Uh, I think uh, emigration has been a problem. Uh, uh, to do research out of India because of uh, you know, a lot of top engineering talent, right, leaving to the to the U.S. and to the Europe, and in general, you know that has been a challenge, right, both from an academic research and an industrial research standpoint. Uh, yeah, so that's immigration, right, not immigration. <laughs> so, so three, just to, just to expand on that, um, you know, yeah, it seems like there are certain aspects of, uh, that are changing, particularly with respect to you know India and China. You know, I know many students, for example, have come to the U.S. Um, you know, from these countries to come you know, get degrees and then now return, or many now stay uh, and pursue technical uh, you know, technical uh, degrees there. What has changed in your mind that has caused that to happen? Well, well, this has been a trend that's been going on for 40 years, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just remarking on that. It's not necessarily a change since the last few years, uh, though there are increasing opportunities for, for research here in India, but still you know, the programs, the research programs are, are certainly superior, right? So there is, you know, emigration, if you will, right? So. <laughs> so let me just flip that on you though, um, Sri. I think, uh, and the way I'll flip that on you is it's a question I wanted to ask earlier. Um, you know, you talked about a lot of uh, interesting research problems that are particular to the Indian context, right? Um, and they're also particular to other development, developing countries, right? And obviously these are countries that comprise a huge swath of, of the global population. So it seems to me that there are so many interesting problems that, that exist there that, that you know, we should be able to um, 
uh, you know, I, I personally am very interested in working on some of those issues, right? But there is, there's not enough of an infrastructure to do that sort of collaboration for me sitting here to work with others um, in India uh, to make progress on this. So, so th there are there are there are some mechanisms, right? It's not like it's it doesn't exist at all, but it's definitely not a business as usual kind of mode of doing research. So I would flip it to you that uh, in some sense, I'm trying. Steve said that we should be controversial. So in some sense, the onus is on you to make it attractive, right, for people from here to work with you on problems that are of immediate interest to you, but as a global society, it should be of interest to me as well. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And so that would that would take care of your immigration problem, no? <laughs> How about you, owner? Do you have a, a perspective on, on uh, uh, sort of national policy influences and and uh, uh, related to Eric's question? I mean, cert uh, certainly, uh, I've experienced it uh, in the U.S. Uh, I don't think the immigration issues are not as bad as uh, what they have been in the U.S. Uh, in Switzerland currently, but I mean, Switzerland uh, has also been affected. Some of the uh, like some uh, some of the visas have been delayed. Uh, perhaps due to the high influence U.S. has over Switzerland uh, over time, uh, even though Switzerland seems to be a neutral country, it's not exactly uh, to correct all the time. Uh, but there are also other interesting issues in Switzerland uh, locally. Uh, for example, currently, uh, Switzerland has been uh, able to participate in EU projects uh, as sole uh, partners, but that has been stalled uh, recently. Uh, so you cannot apply for EU projects as a sole person uh, from Switzerland. So there, there are interesting local issues as well. Uh, I mean, I also have the uh, uh, perspective from Turkey since I interact with a lot of universities here. And I think uh, I agree with uh, Sri a lot uh, in that aspect. This is uh, certainly because of the government, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, policies, uh, let's say against science, uh, people have been emigrating out and that has certainly uh, made the research climate in the country quite, quite poor currently, even though there are a lot of, there's a lot of talent in the country to actually do very strong research. All right. Any other, uh, any other uh, perspective on this question before we move on? Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go to a question from uh, Maria Ruiz Rella. We are witnessing the most amazing advances and discoveries in science and technology in many areas, such as the use of supercomputers, including Fugaku, to accelerate COVID research to mitigate the pandemic. Still globally as humanity, we are facing tremendous social injustice and humanitarian tra tragedies around the globe. What needs to change so that the work of scientists and technologists make a, uh, make a difference and starts to be felt in the lives of the most disadvantaged in society today. That obviously is a very broad problem, right? And you know, hard to map that precisely to to, to microarchitecture. But you know, I think Sarita, you you you, you and, and owner both identified sort of you know uh, societies. Actually, many of you did identify sort of society scale problems that that uh, you know benefit computing. Um, what do you guys think will will be required to you know accelerate that uh, accelerate that progress? And how can we have, how can we play an important part in that role? I think I think this is a super important question. Not, um, I think um, the NSF actually has made a lot of progress on one aspect of these broad societal problems that we could use as a template. And so I refer to uh, the broadening participation program of NSF. Uh, this is not exactly what the person, what uh, Maria is asking, but it gives you a template in the sense that, you know, NSF has been very concerned and um, the country has been very concerned about increasing participation in technology, in academia, in research by underrepresented uh, groups such as, uh, uh, you know, women, black, blacks, all, all, all sorts of underrepresented groups. And what they've done is made programs that address this problem be front and center part of your research proposal 
and research output, right? And so if we want, and, and now it's taken many years, right? And a lot of work by a lot of people to make these things be things that people are thinking about, right? So in the beginning, people were thinking about broadening participation in this ad to do it for an NSF proposal. But now it has permeated our sort of mindset that these are important things. So my point is that for to change that as technologists, we have a lot of um, responsibility, right, towards building technologies that are of, that that are in 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 societal terms reasonable and fair. And we are doing a lot of harm, right? I mean, you see the news every day. Technology is responsible for a lot of harm. Um, so the least we can do is do no harm, right? And then we can do better. And I think. Um, incentivizing people to do no harm and to do better is is a really important function of our funding programs, of our you know everything that incentivizes us, right? I think we there, there's a lot to do here. I mean, this is a really important question, and I think we can have a whole panel devoted to this. But I feel pretty strongly that we as technologists must do something to be better global citizens. Excellent. Would anyone else like to, like to like to add, like to add to that? Pear, do you have something you'd like to add to that? No, I, I mean, so so in in Europe, it's still not. I mean, we get. I hire a lot of people from outside Europe, and uh, uh, so there's not any problem so far. But that can change. I mean, who knows? Um, um, but um, so, so that's good. But there was also something else from Eric Altman that uh, caught my attention. It's about the startup climate in, in, in Europe. And uh, um, so I'm involved in a startup company that, um, and we have got a lot of uh, funding from the European Commission, uh, the simple, simply grants. So they, don't ask for equity or something like that. So they have programs to really support startups, which has been wonderful. And also, uh, then of course, we this company has uh, got um, a lot of uh, traditional investment from uh, institutional um, venture capital firms and uh, and uh, private people. So and and in general in Sweden. Uh, the climate is very good to start a, a company, uh, really. So, and in Europe in general, I would say. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, there's an interesting question here. I'm skipping around a little bit in the questions. Um, there's an interesting question here that, which is perhaps a little more more personal and reflective uh, for for some of you. It says a few panelists did leave their country to pursue other opportunities and achieve personal career growth. Looking back at their personal journey, would they change anything? Also, how would they uh, how would they move if they were in that same spot, or would they move in that, if they were in that same spot today? Do they see any uh, efforts uh, coming from the industry and government side that would affect their decisions? Would anyone like to, like to like to share some personal perspective on uh, on that? I could say moving is a great thing. I'm still in Sweden, but I was actually moving a lot uh, when I was a young uh, uh, academic. Uh, I spent uh, almost one year at Carnegie Mellon as a PhD student, and uh, then ha half a year right after my PhD at Stanford. And that gave enormous value, really. So I would really recommend uh, all young colleagues to at least move a little bit because you get new perspectives and things like that. But I'm a boring guy. I've been in Sweden for so many years. Well, Sri, you, 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 you made an interesting move, of course, you know, uh, coming yeah. to the US and then, uh, you know, uh, going back uh, to India and, and leading yeah. uh, uh, you know, an advanced research yeah. group, which is unusual. What's your perspective? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think when I graduated from my undergraduate in India, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it was a top college, uh, but I couldn't go to a, a good master's or, a, you know, a graduate program in India, right? That would have been a significant step up, right? So, so moving to the US was, was, was probably the only option at that point. And then I wanted to work for a few years. And I think, yeah, working in uh, Intel for, for close to 10 years, uh, you know, in the Bay Area, I think gave me an exposure, you know, in, in different jobs, right? I probably did three different jobs over 10 years. And uh, I think the overall exposure to the, to not just Intel, but also to the Silicon Valley ecosystem, uh, you know, certainly broadened my horizons, right? And, and created a network. Uh, and then when I moved back to India, you know, primarily for family reasons, right? I think uh, it, it sort of helped me sort of help build Intel in India, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, it was possible for us to do larger, more complex products uh, in a more geographically distributed way, right? Because, uh, you know, some of us had that exposure of, uh, of, of working in the, in, in the top product groups uh, in the US, but also, you know, be in a position to be able to attract talent and grow them, uh, you know, in the India geography, right? So, uh, so, so certainly I would yeah, recommend, you know, cross geographical moves, right? And I, I did spend about a year in Israel on relocation and uh, yeah, it, it certainly, you know, this exposure, uh, yeah, you know, has added value to me and, you know, through me to the company, I would assume. Yeah, Onur might have some experiences, uh, you know, uh, CMU, yeah, then uh, sure. UT, CMU, back to uh, Switzerland now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with uh, moving uh, so that you can perhaps uh, like change the environment and also uh, take advantage of different kinds of opportunities. And I mean, certainly I moved from Turkey uh, to the US to do my undergraduate degree. And I stayed there for almost 20 years and moved from CMU to ETH. I think uh, mainly to uh, exploit good opportunities, let's say, uh, in, in many cases. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the person who asked the question asked, would you change anything? I mean, personally, I wouldn't. Uh, but of course, uh, I cannot guess. Uh, how things would have been if the environment was different, right? In, in all those conditions. I think uh, certainly uh, an extremely thriving uh, environment that could have been present in Turkey uh, probably wouldn't have made me move to the US. <laughs> and I think this is, this may be also, uh, this may be also gets back to one of the other questions that Maria was asking, like how do we, how do we maybe equalize more across the world, even though we're a global society working on global problems, I think we have a huge, uh, let's say, disparity in terms of the entire world, uh, in terms of access to opportunities. And uh, yeah, I don't know how to solve that problem exactly. <laughs> we we'll move on to another question. Um, uh, I'm going to broaden the question. This is from uh, uh, Marina Vamu. She says, uh, I'm not aware of many computer architecture academics in the US that did their PhDs outside of the US. Do you have any insights as to why? Is it that PhD students not already in the States are not interested in teaching there? Or is there some kind of bias present in the hiring process? And, and I, I'll probably expand that uh, since we do have uh, uh, academic representation outside of the US. Uh, is that the case in you know, other countries as well? Um, you know, that the uh, faculty there tend to come from universities in that same country, or is there more, uh, should we say, geographic diversity in, in, the, uh, in, in the faculty? So let me open that up uh, and uh, probably get a few opinions on that one from you guys. I can speak for my institution or my department, uh, and uh, we are extremely diverse uh, uh, community, I would say. Uh, I think there are people from 30 countries, only, only in the computer architecture team. I think it's only, yeah, it, it's only myself who 
got the PhD degree from Sweden. The other people got PhD degrees from other countries, even from the United States. So. And what about and what about your students? Where do they aspire to go when they uh, when they graduate if they become, if they want to become professors? Um, so um, some of them have stayed in Sweden. Um, that is true. Um, quite a few uh, went to to Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, uh, not so strange, maybe. Um, uh, and then, of course, also in Sweden too, we have quite big companies like Ericsson that, of course, uh, absorbs uh, these kind of people too. So I would say 50% in Sweden and 50% go abroad. Yeah, I wouldn't say we have a bias. In fact, I think my department, I think we do a pretty good job in um, uh, you know, staying open and we have hired in recent years, people from India uh, who did their PhDs in India, for example, um, from Switzerland, for example. Um, those are the two that come to mind in our recent hires, but um, uh, I'm sure there are more that I'm not thinking about. So yeah, I wouldn't say that there is a bias. Um, but it, it, it is still generally the exception and not the not the rule. And it's, it's, you, know, it's you, have, you, have to, you have to think a little bit to think of, to come up with anyone, uh, right? I think the right question would be how many people apply, right? Mm -hmm. And as a fraction of applications, uh, what do we get? And then uh, whether we should be doing more to have more people apply. Um, and that uh, definitely, I I don't think we we go out of our way to advertise our positions abroad. But definitely, if you have students and you know you're not in the U.S. and and you have um, and you would like to apply to Illinois, I mean, definitely apply, right? It's um, we want the best people, and we really care about about diversity in our department on many counts. All right. Well, I think we have time for one more uh, question. It's a pretty open-ended one. And that is, uh, as computer architects, how can we best tackle climate change? What's the local, what's, what is the low hanging fruit here? Mm. And uh, maybe we can use it, we, we use this to, as, as a vehicle for each of you to have your sort of final, final remarks and, and uh, I'll, I'll just go down the line. Uh, actually, on my, on, my, so on my camera view, owner, why don't you start? I think you might've sort of addressed these, some of this a little bit earlier, but uh, why don't you sum up your thoughts and then we'll move to the left on my screen. Okay, sure. Uh, I mean, I think there are some, um, maybe uh, there are multiple aspects to this. I think there are certainly direct ways and indirect ways uh, to do this. I think indirect ways are certainly making computers a lot more efficient uh, and a higher performance, and hopefully they will be used for good purposes uh, to tackle climate change, right? But there could be also direct ways where uh, you can really uh, take uh, applications that are used in climate modeling and perhaps prediction uh, and things like that that I may be missing at this point. And you can try to make them directly more efficient and accelerate them. I think that's also quite exciting, frankly. And in fact, that's something that we have done uh, more recently collaboratively with IBM Research in Zurich. And I'm quite excited about uh, this sort of research also. Excellent, all right, thank you. Sarita. Yeah, I think this goes back to the whole cross-layer system research, right? So I think a lot of uh, cycles today are spent on machine learning models, which don't necessarily have to be as large as they are. And so how do you work so that you make these, um, uh, you know, whatever is using cycles currently be as efficient as possible? And uh, I mean, there are other ways, right? So making our systems more sustainable, right? That last longer, et cetera. Um, there's, there's just a lot, a lot of low hanging fruit. Oh, and, and uh, do something about our conferences and meetings so we are not uh, burning um, you know, air miles all the time. <laughs> Wait a minute, I think we've been doing just that. <laughs> yeah, but do it, do it, do it uh, voluntarily, <laughs> not, not by force, yeah. <laughs> Sri. 
Yeah, yeah, not a whole lot to add beyond what has already been said, right? I think it's it's primarily, yeah, I would, uh, you know, yeah, go with, uh, you know, you know, reasonably performant uh, machine learning networks uh, that, are, that are reasonably good at uh, solving problems uh, instead of, you know, rent- relentlessly chasing uh, accuracy beyond, uh, you know, necessary levels, right, for, for different use cases uh, and so on. Um, and also... Uh, you know, sort of invest in, um, uh, you know, systems that are able to harvest energy by themselves in the locations in which they're deployed and, uh, you know, using renewable energy sources. I think uh, that's really the way to go for a lot of the, uh, you know, the developing countries and, and especially those with higher populations and, you know, lower per capita incomes and so on, right? So uh, especially if you don't want to create uh, a bigger divide between the haves and the have-nots, right? Uh, yeah. Great, excellent, thank you. Koji. Yes, that's really super important uh, direction or topics. So I think the two uh, side we have to look at. So one is the clean bike computing and other is the clean of computing. So uh, by designing clean of computing, as Sri uh, also pointed out, uh, we can design the uh, environment friendly uh, company platform. By using such kind of platform, we should accelerate the some information technology for uh, for solving many many uh, uh, critical issues. Not only the uh, crime, but also uh, other disasters problem or many many issues we have. So such kind of two directions uh, we need to look at. Great, thank you, and pair. I'm not sure I can add anything to what has been said already, which I totally agree with. But uh, I think uh, this co- our community has been uh, uh, very uh, active in actually uh, working on making more efficient, I mean, um, uh, um, climate friendly uh, technologies. I mean, we started, pro- if I recall, 20 years ago to worry about energy efficiency. and that has uh, just evolved and we have done fantastically well. I mean, if we wouldn't have been active, I mean, I don't know what data centers would dissipate in terms of, you know, electricity consumption. But uh, so now when we are in the era of accelerators, I mean, things can only be better. And uh, as Sarita, I totally agree. I mean, it's super important to work, you know, across the layers in the stack to to become even more energy efficient. Excellent, okay. So with that, let's bring this panel to a close. Let me thank again all the, all the panelists, uh, as well as uh, all the members of the audience, uh, and for those particularly who asked, uh, asked questions and helped help keep this panel moving. Uh, so uh, I will say, uh, you know, good evening, good night, and good morning to our panelists. Uh, someone uh, noted, Koji, that uh, we now see light coming through your window, so yeah. time has progressed. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And uh, thank you all again, and uh, we hope everyone uh, enjoys a good rest of the conference. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.